Welcome everyone to day two of the Spring Home Buying Forum hosted by us at Harvard University Employees Credit Union through our Thrive Personal, Finan Personal Financial Wellness Program. My name is Magdalia Gomez. I'm the AVP of Community Engagement and I'm joined with the Community Engagement team, Sarah Scruggs and Dominique Verdu, and they will be monitoring the chat today. I know most of us are at this point very familiar and very comfortable with Zoom or GoToWebinars, but I still want to give an overview to make sure that we're all able to enjoy today's forum as much as possible. Do know that we have gone ahead and muted folks so that if you are having lunch or maybe just out and about or there's a child or a dog in the background, no worries, we will not hear that. But we do still want to make sure that we're answering your questions. This forum is all about you. We want to make sure that the home buying process is something that isn't stressful, that we can try to make it as enjoyable as possible. And part of, way, of the way that we'll do that is answering questions that you may have. So during today's webinar, please use the question and answer, answer feature of Zoom to ask any questions that you may have. We also are recording today's presentation. So you will be able to see this again in the future. Um, or if you have to step away for a moment, know that you can watch the recording. Everyone that has registered will get a copy of the recording in the next couple of business days. You can also sign up now or follow us on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash myhvcu, so that you can get notified when the video is up. We also do have a post-workshop survey, and we really hope that you take the time to complete the survey. It helps us be better, and the better that we are, the more that we can provide information for you. And in addition, anyone that for every survey that is completed, we're going to make a donation to the Cambridge YWCA to support those that are unhoused in our community. So not only are you helping us, but you'll be helping others by completing the survey. We also have some raffle prizes and just by attending, you are already automatically added to the raffle. So you'll be, we'll be able to know that you're on and you'll be able to win one of these many different prizes. Now, the couple of the prizes that we have, we have an Amazon Echo Dot, we have a Ring doorbell, and we have some HVCU swag. And again, you don't have to do anything. Just by being here, automatically, you are entered into these raffles. And we'll be in contact, either myself, Sarah, or Dominique, via email in the next couple of days to notify those that have won. Now, who exactly are we at the Harvard University Employees Credit Union? Well, we are not-for-profit banking for the Harvard community. And that includes anyone that is at one of the Harvard teaching hospitals, at Harvard the institution, the students, the alumni, the staff, the retirees, anyone within our community. And the benefit of us being for the community is that we're focused on helping. We have the same products and services as a bank, but they're customized to serve our community. And the great thing about us is that we're accessible everywhere. So yes, we have our branches in Cambridge. We have a branch, a couple of other branches. We have one in Mass General Hospital, but you don't have to go to a branch to do business with us. You can bank with us anywhere that you are in the world. Uh, we typically have folks that are joining us from all parts of the, the world. Uh, we've had presentations where people are joining us from uh, all, all continents, actually. So it's really great that you can bank with us anywhere you are. And the Better dif the bitter difference really is that we are better in every way. We're able to provide better service, but have a better business mo model. And we also have better value because we're focused as a not-for-profit on doing what's best for our community. And one of the ways that we do that is by presentations such as these, where it's really just about education. We wanna make sure that you are empowered as a consumer to make the decisions that are going to be best for your finance finances. And there are times that we will be very on, we'll always be very honest with you, but we'll be the first to let you know if there is another offer that may be better for you to take, we'll be honest with you because we are caring about you as an individual and we wanna make sure that you're doing what's best for your financial well-being. So for those that weren't able to join yesterday, the Home Buying Forum is a three-day event. And yesterday, we were able to have a great presentation. We had over 200 folks attend, and we learned about the real estate market trends. Now, these were presented by a real estate agent and an appraiser. We learned a lot of good information. And if you missed it, no worries. Follow us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash myhvcu, or you'll get the recording when all of the presentations have happened. And tomorrow, we are 
going to hear from our home buying experts at the credit union, our home financing experts. We're going to go through the entire home buying process. So the same link, 12 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, we hope that you will join us. And we have a presentation in Spanish at 1.30. So whether you prefer English or Spanish, you can get information about the home buying process. But we're here for day two. So what are we going to talk about today? And what are we going to, who are we going to hear from? Well, we have a lot of great speakers that are here to help us. We have Ryan Douglas, who's one of our home financing experts. And Ryan serves those in the Assembly Road community. We also have Mike Levine, who serves those in the Harvard Square community. And then we have our two key presenters, Bill and Paul. And I'm going to take myself a video for a moment just to read their bios. And then I'm going to ask Bill to join us on camera so that he can get us started. So first I'll give you a quick introduction as to who, a little bit of background regarding Paul. Paul Cole is our second speaker. He's a real estate and business attorney in Lexington, Massachusetts. He has almost 30 years of experience practicing in real estate and title matters, particularly residential and commercial con conveyancing. He represents buyers, sellers, and lenders in closings for purchases and sales. Paul also advises landlords and tenants on residential and commercial leases, and he does business formation and corporate governance. And we'll be hearing from Paul after Bill's presentation. And now we, I'll introduce Bill Donahue. And Bill, I'll also ask you to join, uh, share your video and share your camera. Bill has a business degree in Stonehill College. He has been in the automotive in manufacturing industry, has attempted a career in country music, and I was fortunate enough to hear Bill sing not too long ago, so he has a great voice. Bill has also done marketing for a construction company and medical manufacturing. And all of those careers were before 1999 when he officially joined Tiger Home Inspection. Bill started as the marketing manager and throughout the years earned licenses in real estate, residential appraisals, Title V inspections, certified lead painting, late lead paint inspections, and has his radon gas inspection certificate. We're very, very fortunate to have Bill with us today. And Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you so that you can educate us on the home buying and home inspection process specifically. Okay, okay, okay. How's everybody doing? This is Bill. I'm from Tiger Home Inspection. It was a very impressive uh, resume that uh, Magdalia just spoke about. Uh, not sure if it was actually mine or not, but it, <laughs> uh, it seemed seemed like uh, it seemed like a lot. So I've been in the business for a long time. We're in the home inspection part of the process, if you will. And I congratulate you all for actually coming to or listening to this program. It's pretty simple. Knowledge is power. A lot of people that don't attend programs uh, or listen to these type of podcasts um, or research it end up looking for a home that uh, and they're taking the advice of just the real estate agent without knowing really what else to do. So they're instructed by the real estate agent most of the time. Now you have some idea of who's in this process, right? So we have a real estate agent, we have a Harvard uh, Employees Credit Union, Harvard Employee, Harvard University Credit Union. And uh, you have the attorney, Paul, you have, uh, uh, who else do we have? Do we have me? We have a real estate agent. So at least you know that we're all part of this process, okay? Where do we come into the process? We come in after you find a home that uh, you want, you put in an offer, okay? And the seller accepts your offer. And typically it's written into, it's called an offer to purchase. You might've been over it yesterday, uh, listening to a real estate agent. Uh, it's called the offer to purchase. The offer to purchase is done before the main contract. Paul will go over that with you. But uh, the offer to purchase, uh, so you have 10 days to get a home inspection is put in there. It's a contingency as well as get you know, your uh, mortgage rolling. So you get 10 days 
And in the springtime, you really need to get right on it. Okay. So when I'm going to tell you why we we're located in Braintree, Mass. That's where all our phones ring into our inspectors that cover from Southern New Hampshire down to Rhode Island through Massachusetts, out through central mass and all of Eastern Massachusetts. Okay. So we have 28 home inspectors that uh, all live in that geographical area. So when you're looking for a local inspector, that's what you're going to get as a local inspection because that's where our home inspector is from. So when we get an order in for home inspection, it goes to that person that's right near that town that's lived there their entire lives or et cetera, okay? So uh, we are the largest home inspection company in the Northeast um, and we're a family run business, second generation. Uh, and it's run like a family run business. Um, you know, I've been in a lot of different industries, especially the medical industry, where you know there are actual emergencies, and 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 with us, everything is an emergency. If somebody calls looking for me, it's an emergency. And if you don't call back, they will track you down. They will track you. They'll, they usually work for ARP or uh, <laughs> ARP is the one that can find you anywhere. You know, so well, you guys probably don't know that yet because you're not my age. But at any rate, um, they they're very good at it. So you give us a call. Seven days a week, we're open from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. You always get somebody live on the phone. And that's the way we've done it since day one. Um, so we're not into uh, automated uh, uh, you know, messaging. We're into talking to people live. Uh, so if you have a problem of any kind, you have any questions that you're out there in the field, whether you use us or not, please don't hesitate to call us. Uh, if you see a situation in a house that you're looking at, that you might want just some general knowledge on, please call us, okay? So uh, now, what would you do? So now we have the when do you get a home inspection? Is that the offer to purchase? After the offer to purchase, 10 days, get right on it, especially in the springtime. So if we have 28 to 32 home inspectors any spring, we could be booked out eight, nine days, which means the people that we compete against, the one and two man bands are flat out for two weeks. All right, so you only have 10 days to do it. And you might wanna think about it prior to even going into this process of the offer, have somebody available, do a little bit of research. You know, when you go into uh, Harvard and they tell you use a uh, Tiger home inspection and the agent says, you know, puts on, uh, on a list of, of uh, potential home inspectors to use and Tiger's on there, we're just happy to be on the list, okay? And usually they'll give you three names, research them. And with that research, uh, ask some questions, ask some questions, and I have a few here that you could ask, all right? Uh, the first one would be, will your inspection meet recognized standards? It's an excellent question. And uh, yes, ours do, absolutely. But ask everybody else out there whether they are up to, up to uh, the code, if you will, of our standards. We were licensed, or the state of Massachusetts was licensed in 2001. And we were instrumental in, in having licensing because there were so many people out there that could just hang a shingle and say they were a home inspector and they just weren't qualified to do it. So uh, back then they were buying, uh, or they, weren't, they, were, they were groups, they weren't buying groups, but they were groups of um, associations, if you will, that had a higher standard than the particular state that they might be uh, inspecting in they would go and get certified by, there's a couple of them. One is NAHI, which is a national association. And one is ASHI, which is the American Society of Home Inspectors. Okay, that was important back. It might still be important in other states. It's not as important anymore in Massachusetts because since licensing, so that's 2001, we're 21 years into it now. And every year we have a board and every year they come up with something new to put on the home inspection. You know, sort of checklist, if you will. Um, so now our training, and the training of our home inspectors, is uh, supersedes any of those uh, programs that are out there, whether it be ASHI or NAHI. Okay. So if somebody said to you, you need to get an ASHI inspector, that was years ago. You're probably better off with an ASHI inspector. But now the laws in Massachusetts, what the home inspectors have to follow is uh, more stringent than those programs, okay? So just to have a mass license, but make sure they do have a mass license, especially if you're buying up on the borders of New Hampshire or the borders down by Rhode Island, 
because home inspectors and agents will be dual licensed and they will sell properties back and forth between Mass and New Hampshire. And if you get somebody from New Hampshire that's not licensed in Mass, et cetera, okay? You gotta make sure that they have a Massachusetts license. Uh, that's number one. So up to date, because we find out there every now and then we get a report in from somebody that says, here's our inspection report. We take a look at it. Now, maybe it was our inspection report, maybe 10, 15 years ago. So obviously they're not up to date. They're required to take continuing ed credits, which we offer uh, everybody in the industry. We offer our competitors a program for continuing ed every quarter of the year so that they can keep up with their continuing ed credits as well. Um, people think it's a great idea that, uh, you know, we, our competitor, their competitor is putting on their programs and they'll come to our, our programs. It turns out that where we had our program in Lombardi's in uh, Randolph, turned out that Ashley started a program there right after us. So we must be doing okay uh, in terms of that. Um, so that's so you when you're looking for a home inspector, you want to know are they up to uh, up to standard, if you will, on their reports? Okay, do they take continuing ed credits? That's another question. Uh, one of the questions that I see around there pertain to the Ashi and Nahi. Do you belong to those groups? We still we have inspectors. Probably maybe half of them still belong to the groups. Just just to belong, just to say we belong. But again, it's unnecessary. Okay. Um, Look at how experienced they are. Ask them. Ask them these questions. I mean, don't be afraid to. It's not. People ask us questions every day. Uh, how long have we been in business? So we've been in business since 1990, 22 years. We're coming up on a half a million home inspections in that period of time, a half a million home inspections. And we're competing with guys that are doing two or three hundred home inspections a year. So we have a we have a vast supply of knowledge, if you will, in our archives. And up here, it's important, more important, because in New England, there's so many different types of homes. There's so many different ages. There's so many different types. Uh, you go to Florida, everything is sort of the same. It's no basements, and it, pretty much they're the same type of inspection. <clears throat> Excuse me. So up here, it's really important to have that kind of experience. So ask them how experienced they are. Not that they come out of a trade and they just went into the business. They may be great anyway, coming down the road, they'd be a little bit better with experience, okay? I think everybody would agree with that. <clears throat> um, do we focus on residential? Make sure they focus on residential. We do a little bit of commercial, uh, which is really mixed use. So mixed use is uh, condo complex potentially, there's a lot of new construction out there now where they have retail stores underneath the condos. And so we would do something like that. Mixed use is part commercial, part residential. We don't do any high rise condos or apartments or anything. That's left up to uh, uh, really the commercial uh, uh, inspectors, okay? So we're strictly residential, but we will delve into the commercial if you, if you need uh, you know, the small and a mid-size potentially, all right? Um, now, will you offer to do repairs? This question was in uh, uh, an article put out by, um, I think it was put out by FHA, I believe it was. Uh, will you offer to do repairs and improvements? So we're in there telling you about a home inspection. We're looking around the house. We said this you know, needs further evaluation. Well, what is a first time home buyer going to ask? They're going to ask, how much is that going to cost me? How much is that going to cost me? We are, it's against the law for us to tell you that, okay? It's against the law. In Massachusetts, maybe not in another state, but in our state, it is against the law. And it should be because we don't know. When we go into a house, we are a guest. We can't take things apart in order to figure out how much something would cost. Even if one of our guys was in the trades, which happens a lot, you'll get somebody that was a plumber that doesn't want to do any plumbing anymore and comes in to be a home inspector. But when it comes to plumbing, he likes to talk about it because he's got a vast knowledge of plumbing and he may be tempted to say how much something would cost, but he cannot do it. And I'm not talking about something little like a, a plug, like a GFI plug that you, you know, outlet that you can get at Home Depot for $10. I'm talking about anything that's, you know, that is, it takes, that's a little bit involved. We leave that up to the experts. So, I'll say it now, we're sort of very loosely based, very loosely based on a, the primary care physician when you go for your physical and 
everything's great. Your knees hurt for a little while. It keeps swelling up. But what does your PC do? Well, if they've already given you some advice over you know, the last couple of years, it's still doing it. They're going to send you to a specialist. And that's exactly what we do. So we're going to cover the whole house. We're going to make decisions on what uh, the grade, what condition these, uh, you know, the house is in as we break it down, uh, maintenance tips along the way. And if we feel it needs further evaluation from an expert in that particular field, somebody that's licensed uh, electrician or a licensed plumber, then we're, that's what you're hiring us to do is to take it a step further. Okay. So, and that's, and that is a very important point to make sure you do follow through with that. I'm going to expound on that a little bit later. So uh, how long does the inspection take? It's typically two to three hours, depending upon what we have. Uh, if it's a condo, uh, if, you know, if it's a garden style condo, say, uh, there's, not, there's not a whole bunch to inspect, but we have to inspect the areas, uh, common areas, not necessarily, but the heating, the roof, anything that may be applied to an assessment to you later on. In other words, if you're buying a condo and you're in an association, the roof, while well, all of the owners of that association that are in the association would have to pay for a new roof and they, they give you an assessment. And so we're gonna go up there and, and take a look at the roof and see what kind of shape it's in, obviously. Same thing with the heating systems, if they're individual or common heat, depending upon what they are. So we deal with the maintenance manager on that and getting us into those areas that we can inspect and then, of course, the unit itself. All right. Um, yes, it's smaller, but it's still sort of the same inspection process that we go through. But it might not take us as long as the point. Now, on the other hand, if it's a very large Victorian with a lot of different owners and a lot of different uh, additions that were put on or work that had been done over the years piecemeal, then there's a lot of things to look at and how these all come together and how they meet. So that might take a little bit longer. But, but focus on two to three hours. Um, and, and focus on focusing. How's that? Focus on focusing uh, for that two or three hours. Listen to the home inspection. There's another question in there about, will I be able to attend the home inspection? Absolutely. We wouldn't do it without you unless you can't be there for some reason. We strongly suggest that you are, but if you can't, you can't. Um, and then it's going to be up to your agent and us to try to communicate it to you best we can. Um, through the report, what happened. Uh, sometimes we find that's where the breakdown of communication is, is uh, one person to the next. Uh, there was an old, there was an old exercise and I, I think it's actually called something, but I remember it in the fifth grade. It was the only thing I remember from elementary school. Sit in a circle, somebody tells a story and by the time it comes all the way around, it's a totally different story. So that happens to us sometimes in the home inspection business. Your home inspector said this, I wasn't there, but the, the uh, Broker told me, and then the broker would say, no, it was actually my, my assistant and blah, blah, blah. So it goes through four or five people before it gets to us. And that's not what was said at all. So make sure you read that report that we give you. I'm going to go over that in a little bit as well. Um, so we, we don't do any repairs. Remember, we don't, can't give you any prices. And uh, what type of inspection report do you provide is a PDF, uh, computerized report. Uh, they'll take, basically, we're gonna, you're going to follow us around. All right, we're going to meet you at the property. When you get there, you probably see the home inspector outside. And they'll be looking through binoculars at the roof. 95% um, of home inspectors don't go up on roofs, by the way, <clears throat> because they weren't coming down the same way they were going up. That was a major issue. Um, secondly, uh, you know, after that, which was the most serious part, of course, was when people backed out of a home inspection or backed out of the offer, um, the, the seller would uh, decide to sue us for ruining the roof because we walked on it. And, you know, you have some of those type of people out there that do those things. So uh, it's unnecessary to go up on a roof. We give our inspectors what we call an audible on site. So if for whatever reason they can't see every part of the roof through binoculars, they will bring a ladder with them and they will go up on the roof, okay, if they have to for you because we work for you. So the most important part of that inspection anyway is through the attic because what are we looking for? What does a roof do? A roof keeps out the elements, right? Rain mostly, snow, et cetera. So that's what we want to make sure that it's, it's uh, waterproof inside. 
rain water is not coming down and that we're going to see all kinds of stains up there over the years. You can literally tell, it's almost like a tree with the rings. You can tell some of them are older, this one's a newer one, this line right here, this is more recent, et cetera. So that's the most important part of the actual roof inspection anyway. So perfectly okay. In case somebody calls and says, the home inspector didn't go on the roof. All right, so those, those are the, uh, we also take pictures of anything that's suspect, by the way. Uh, you know, a, a picture says a thousand words. So uh, what happens is if we think it's suspect, and we're going to put it in the report as something that needs further evaluation. We'll take a picture of it. So there's a reference point to it. It helps everybody in the process, especially the real estate agents, the attorney, um, Paul, that he can take a look at the picture and say, okay, I understand you know, what, what's wrong with this potentially. Um, so you will get a PDF. We can get it out that night. We guarantee it by the next morning, but if we need to, in the essence of time, then we will get it to you that evening. Uh, just specify it to the uh, agent when, uh, or even when you call in to 1-800-62-TIGER. I know this is strictly educational, but that is an education. I just told you the number. 1-800-62-TIGER. Bill, I like, I like that segue. I like how, how you were able to do that. <laughs> well, it is educational and that's, that's educational, true. right? I just told you you didn't know that. And now it's something you know. I knowledge, like that. Power, knowledge is power. <laughs> and okay. we have about two more minutes, Bill, two before minutes. we turn it over to Paul. It's, Paul. <laughs> it's going to be really hard for you, buddy. All right, listen. So this is the other thing. So when you call into 1-800-62-TIGER at Tiger Home Inspection, um, the, uh, okay, so what we do basically on the phone is we're going to ask, I'm going to just really run through it really quick, right? So we're going to gather the information that we need. We, why do we ask you all these questions? Because we have to figure out what you may need or may require for that particular inspection of that house. So we want the size of the house, bedrooms, uh, bathrooms, over eight rooms, you know, how many rooms, is there two kitchens, et cetera? Is there a detached unit out back? Is there a garage? We have to ask all those questions. We will help you with that if you don't know. All of that is typically listed on the MLS sheet. So, but we will help you with it by looking up while we're on the phone with you, we'll look up the property and we'll go through this with you, okay? Um, so then we'll say, they'll tell you that basically the same thing I just told you about the inspector will meet you there. And these are the things that, uh, that we do. He'll start on the outside, he or she will start on the outside, uh, roof down to the foundation, like we just talked about. And again, so we're breaking it down into say 14 components. The roof is one, the siding is another, the foundation is one. Wood boring insect infestation. The home inspector will walk around the house with a probe and they'll hit the sill, which is right above the concrete. The sill is a wood structure that sits on top of the concrete. You don't see it because the siding comes over it. But that's where your termites and your carpenter ants and powder post beetles go to live or eat the wood. It's a whole nother story if you wanted me to go into why termites eat wood um, and carpenter ants just live in it. So they can be very destructive, obviously but we will be able to tell you whether there was past uh, infestation, present infestation, et cetera, okay? And potentially future based on the grading around the house and a home inspector would go over all that. So surface of the grading, gutters and downspouts, obviously. Um, interior, exterior, decks, porches, walkways, driveway, et cetera, those types of things. Uh, I thought I already said that. Uh, go into the interior, we're gonna check all the mechanical systems for you. So we're gonna run the heating system. I'm going to turn up all the zones to 85 to make sure they all work properly. We'll go around with a thermostat and check all the outlets, check all the vents, make sure everything is hot. There's been variably, there's a room in an older house that's a little bit colder than the rest. Um, so all those are checked. Uh, the, the, we take off the electric panel, uh, which is the subject with the electricians, but you know, so we're, we're fighting that one out. I think we shouldn't touch it, but I don't know how we're going to inspect it for you if we don't. So, and all that's all about is, you know, potentially if we see any rust in there, we're going to say, well, there was water that came in at one time, water and electricity. So now we're going to have you get a licensed electrician in there to take a look at how much that's going to cost you. Okay. Uh, check the doors, windows, floor, Let's put a marble on the floor and see which direction the house is going in. And a lot of it's typical because of settling depends on the age of the house. Uh, but want to make sure all the windows are opening and all the doors work properly, sort of minor things. We'll run the appliances, not the refrigerator. And, and Paul probably won't go over that with you. He doesn't have enough time. But 
Uh, they own the refrigerator, but the stove will turn on the dishwasher. Do you want you to remember this? And I know we're getting there, Meg Dahlia, um, that as of the day of inspection, the day of inspection, we run the wash machine, we show it to you, et cetera. When you move in two months later and it doesn't work, it's not our fault. OK, I don't know whose fault it is, but it's not our fault. So when people call and say, the whole, well, it worked when we were there. Otherwise, we would have noted it and said it didn't work, okay? So when we run appliances, just keep that in mind. Uh, we can't see behind walls. We can't see areas that we don't have access to. And it may be in a question that'll come up or I'll bring it up, but we can't access what we can't, we can't examine, inspect what we can't access. If we can't get into the attic, we can't get up there. We can't inspect it for you, and it becomes your responsibility. If there's things around the outside of the house, like a boat and cars or whatever, that we can't get at that section of the house to see if there's insects, then we can't get at that. So we tell you to tell your agent to tell the other agent to make sure that the house is ready for a home inspection, ready for a home inspection, okay? Thank you, um, Bill. I think um, that might be a good place for us to okay. turn it over to yeah, Paul. Yeah, we ordering questions. Yeah, Thank you very much for listening. Questions. Thank you. And Paul, I will turn it over to you if you want to unmute yourself and I'll share your, the screen for you. Um, thank you, McDalia. Hi. Uh, as McDalia uh, pointed out, I'm Paul Clough. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing uh, for nearly uh, 30 years in this area. And um, I'd like to welcome you all to the forum. And I thank the credit union for inviting me to be a presenter. Um, I think this is a brilliant forum uh, because the home buying process can be a very intimidating one. And so um, when, I, when I was thinking about this uh, forum, I had assumed that uh, most attendees would be uh, first time home buyers, but it doesn't really matter whether you're a first time home buyer or not. Um, as a, from the real estate attorney's perspective, um, the home buying process is the same for everybody. The only variable that, that there is is that is the buyer's familiarity with the process and uh, consequently the buyer's level of comfort. And uh, that's another way of saying, um, you know, the buyer might be experiencing, buyers might be experiencing stress. So it's my job, um, I believe, as an attorney in the process of, of of a buyer buying a home to help reduce that stress. In fact, I think that's the job of everybody that's involved in, in the process. Uh, I was gonna tell you a quick story, but uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll just cut it down and, and, and give you the, the punchline to it. And uh, uh, when I was, my wife and I, when we were first buy, uh, buying our first home, uh, I thought at one point I was having a heart attack and it actually turned out that it was a panic attack. So I well know that people uh, experience stress in this, in this process. So how do we deal with that? Well, uh, fast forwarding 28 years, um, and it doesn't take 28 years to, to gain this uh, perspective. Um, I, I hope that you can gain it right away, but I think the single, the single the most important thing that a home buyer can do is to uh, buy into the team approach um, for the, for the process of buying a home. That is um, lean on, on the team that consists of your broker, uh, the inspector like Bill, um, the, the attorney that you choose, and of course the, uh, the staff of the um, credit union mortgage loan department. Um, by buying into the team approach, uh, you can lean on a vast amount of experience and you build trust into that process and consequently you gain a high level of comfort that things will get done right and they'll get done on time um, and in turn this is going to allow you as the buyers to focus on your tasks while knowing that everything else is being taken care of in other words you get to offload stress so um i'm going to turn we should go to uh, slide two just very quickly thank you Medalia. um over the course of the years, I've, I've come to view the home buying process really as a three-stage process using that team approach that we just discussed. There's the offer stage, 
there's the purchase and sale agreement stage, and then there's the closing stage. For purposes of this discussion, uh, we'll move to slide three. For purposes of this discussion, um, we're gonna just give a cursory overview of the, of the offer stage and get more into the weeds and in the other stages. Um, we'll assume that, um, that you've conducted a property search, you learned how to do that, um, and you, you've identified the home that you want to purchase and you want to make an offer on it. Um, the role of the real estate broker here is, is pivotal. Um, attorneys aren't usually involved in this. People don't usually ask an attorney for advice on this or to get involved. They usually use a broker. They've got the wealth of experience, but attorneys they can do it depending upon who they are, of course. Um, and then there are other factors involved in the offer stage, um, dealing with contingencies like the inspection contingency that Bill talked about. And then there's a, a financing contingency. Um, uh, but we can get into more of that later. And if there isn't anything that's covered here, by the way, feel free to pick up the phone and call me and I can go through with you. Um, there's, a, there's also uh, something that enhances offers. Um, it, and that is if you get a letter from your lender, from the credit union, um, saying that you're pre-qualified or maybe even pre-approved to get your loan. And those types of things uh, give weight to your offer, make you more competitive. Uh, and then of course, um, there's the home inspections. We don't need to talk about that because Bill just did uh, quite a nice job talking about that. So then we can move on to the next slide and get into the second stage which is uh, the purchase and sale agreement. So we're at a point now where the offer has been accepted by the seller. And at this point in the process, the buyer should definitely engage an attorney to represent them because they're about to enter into a legal contract to purchase a home. There's a four page base agreement that's produced by the uh, Greater Boston Real Estate Board and it pretty much serves as the foundation for all uh, purchase and sale agreements. And uh, in the business we call the uh, purchase and sale agreements PNSs. So when I refer, that's what I'm talking about. I'm gonna start calling PNSs. Um, but that four page base agreement uh, is not sufficient in and of itself. Um, both parties, seller and buyer, but especially the buyers need added protections. And this is why you need your attorney involved. The process unfolds like this. The seller is responsible for producing the first draft of the PNS and sending it to the buyer's attorney. And from that point on, the buyer's attorney, your attorney, should be quarterbacking, uh, to, to steal a football phrase, or, or controlling the PNS process. The buyer's attorney's responsibilities include uh, establishing contact with the buyer's broker and obtaining the final offer signed by the, both parties. Um, we review the PNS draft right from the seller to make sure that, that one, the terms are consistent with the offer, that any inspection issues are included in the, in, in the PNS, and that the usual customary uh, buyer protections are included, and, and they're numerous. The seller's attorney and the buyer's attorney go back and forth exchanging red line versions of the, of the uh, PNS until they have an agreed upon version. And usually that, that doesn't take more than, more than a day or two, depending upon how busy folks are. Uh, and then the agreed upon version is then shared with the, um, with the parties. So as, as, as your attorney, I would share the agreement with you uh, well in advance of the, of the date that you're supposed to be signing it so that you can review it, uh, ask any questions you want about it, uh, and then um, the the, P, the uh, PNS would be subject to your feedback as well as the sellers. Uh, so the attorneys don't make the final call. We just share it with you, and then, and then eventually, people say that they're fine with uh, how it is, and we enter into the signing process. And that's a process controlled primarily by the brokers. Uh, and these days, it's all uh, done electronically. And um, what the buyer needs to be able to do. Uh, in addition to signing the purchase and sale agreement, the buyers always sign the purchase in the PNS first. And what they need to be prepared to do is to also deliver 
uh, the balance of the deposit funds that they're going to need um, to deliver over to the listing broker. The listing broker holds the deposit funds until um, that's the closing date. So those are the two things. You're going to sign the agreement and you're going to deliver your, um, your, your remaining funds for the deposit. Uh, it's important that once the PNS is uh, finally signed by the parties, that um, fully signed version is forwarded to the credit union because the credit union needs the signed PNS to keep their process moving. And that can be done by either you directly with your uh, your MLO, your mortgage loan originator, a mortgage loan officer at the credit union, or you can do it through through your attorney. So the PNS is done. And now we enter into the closing stage. That would be the next slide. And the closing stage um, is, uh, is, is different from the other two stages. <clears throat> Everything happens in a linear fashion in the other two stages. That is one thing happens after the other and not before. But in the closing stage, it's a longer period of time. It's about four to eight weeks. Um, I would say most four, four weeks to, uh, from the PNS signing to the uh, closing date, the actual closing date, four weeks is pretty quick. One month is, is, is pretty quick. But eight weeks, two months is, is a little bit uh, long. We normally see something in the six week range. But during that period of time, there are a lot of moving parts, everything happening at the same time. So there's different responsibilities uh, for different parties involved in the process. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the buyer's action items on the next slide. Um, and we'll talk about what the attorneys also do. And we won't talk about what the credit union is doing because they're gonna have their own segment uh, uh, where they're gonna present all of that. But the buyer's action items are that you really need to focus on uh, feeding the credit union um, what they've asked for in order to qualify for the loan. You gotta come up with the information in a timely fashion. And it's really important that because now we're on a track to a certain date, the closing date, that um, all the information uh, is provided to them so they can work with it and get you, get you approved. You should also at the same time be working on um, arranging for your insurance on the property. You should, um, one of the other dates we're working toward is, is the mortgage loan commitment date. That's the date by which the credit union will tell you that you are approved. Um, subject to maybe some a few conditions, but uh, you got to make sure that those conditions that you can definitely meet, but you want to be able to be in a position where you're going to have loan approval from the credit union by that commitment date that's in the PNS. And if you don't, then you're faced with a choice of, of whether to go whether to go forward without the commitment or um, you terminate the deal and get your deposit money back. But this hardly ever happens uh, that you have to terminate the deal or that you don't get your financing. But, and in some cases we even ask for an extension of that loan commitment date, but everybody's here to help you through that part. Um, there is, uh, as we get towards the end of this four to week, six, uh, four to six, four to eight week period, there's, um, there's a point in time where you're gonna to have to acknowledge the closing disclosure statement. A closing disclosure statement we call the CD. And I do discuss that a little bit, uh, a little bit later in more depth, but there's, there's a, a point in time, at least three business days ahead of the closing um, date. And that's by um, federal regulation that you need to acknowledge having received a copy of the CD. Uh, that's also an easy process. It's handled totally by the credit union's uh, closing department, and it's, it really is a smooth process. They do a very nice job with that. Um, you need to be making uh, appropriate preparations to provide the balance of the funds that you're going to need to bring to the closing table, and those funds must be what we call good funds by law. You can't take a personal check, so you need lots of people hold uh, 
this money in some kind of an investment, you need to have that liquidated and ready to send to the closing attorney who collects that money um, in, a, in a timely fashion. So sometimes there's a three or four day period to get those things out of some kind of a, a investment. Just need you to be able to be mindful of that. Um, all the while, while all these things are going on, you really should be uh, preparing for your move. I mean, that's one of the one of the focus points for you is how am I going to get from where I live now to the next place? So you need to be focusing on how to do that. And then on the eve, maybe the day before the actual closing date, you'll do, be doing a final walkthrough. That is, you visit the property with your with your broker and you walk through the entire house and you're looking for uh, whether or not there's any kind of unexpected damage there. And you want to make sure that the house is in broom clean condition. We call it that because the sellers need to have removed everything out of the house, except for what you had agreed upon in the purchase and sale will remain. But those are your, those are your main tasks. And while we're, while everybody else on your team is working and doing their job, we're, we're hopeful that um, we've allowed you the time to be able to focus on, on those things. The closing attorney tasks, um, I'll make one general comment, and that is that um, the closing attorney's primary responsibility involves securing information needed from the seller side. And um, so there isn't a whole lot of need for the attorney and the buyer um, to be talking uh, on a regular basis. That doesn't mean I don't want to, and it doesn't mean I'm, that the, the closing attorney isn't available to you. But the fact of the matter is that most of the information we need to get comes from the seller side, or it comes in relationship to the title. Now the title, uh, this is a big part of the closing attorney's task, okay? The title is um, the ownership record of, of current and previous owners of the property that's recorded at the registry of deeds in the county where the property lies. It's the attorney's responsibility for ensuring that good title to the property is conveyed from the seller to the buyer. Now, ensuring that what we call good and marketable title is conveyed from, is the responsibility of the buyer side of Massachusetts. That is not the case in most states in the United States where it's the seller's responsibility for delivering good title as well as providing and paying for the title insurance. We're in a minority of states where that's completely reversed. It all falls to the buyer side. So we, Hi, Paul, we do is we- just want to do a quick time check. We have about three minutes before the Q&A okay. portion. Thank you. Okay. Um, we order a title exam. The title exam uh, needs to be by statute of 50 year, um, exam, then we get we get a report on it. We, we cross-reference it by reviewing the title ourselves. And then we communicate with the seller's attorney on, on what problems need to be fixed. And all of them get fixed by the closing or we can't close. Um, we also get municipal information, you know, information from the cities and towns where the property is. Um, we wanna make sure there are no municipal liens on the property. And then we get into the closing disclosure state, um, the CD again, which is formally called the settlement statement. Now this is the document that calculates the amount of funding that the buyer will need to provide by the date of closing and the net amount that is due to the seller. So the calculation is basically the purchase price plus all the closing costs, less any amounts credited on behalf of the buyer, uh, like deposits made by the buyer and the amount of the, lo of the loan coming from the credit union. The attorney prepares the initial draft of the CD, gathers all the information, then sends it over to the credit union. Uh, the closing department finalizes the CD and then they go through the acknowledgement process that we talked about a little bit early. The closing date is the date set in the PNS. Uh, we've worked for this date. Now everything culminates in this one moment when we sit around a closing table and we actually do the closing, we sign the paperwork. Uh, sellers do not participate in that. Uh, Pre-COVID sellers, um, it was trending that sellers were doing things remotely and sending things by uh, overnight delivery through their attorney. Uh, now that COVID came along, completely knocked out sellers and buyers sitting around a table and doing the closing. It's just uh, the buyers and, and the attorney. 
after the closing, all the paperwork signed, the attorney attends to the recording of the deed, the mortgage, the declaration of homestead. If you don't know what that is, I can talk to you about that uh, offline, but we need to uh, keep moving along. Then the attorney makes um, disbursements. It's the attorney who collects all the loan money from the, um, from the lender, from the credit union in this case, and from, from the buyer. All the money is pooled into special accounts that we have for conveyancing and um, after the closing and not until the deed is actually recorded at the registry of deeds are we authorized to make those disbursements. And the disbursements are mainly uh, paying the seller the net balance due and paying off uh, any mortgages that the, that the seller had. Uh, title insurance, uh, the, the, uh, we could talk a lot about this. We could have a whole segment on title insurance. So I will just say that um, the loan policy and an owner's policy protecting you against any defects in the title is extremely important that uh, buyers also buy a policy. Loan policies protect the, the lender, but it's important that, and they don't protect you. So the, it's important that the, the owner actually buys that policy and the title, the closing attorney is a title agent for the title insurance company. So they issue, we issue the title insurance policies post-closing. In summary, I will just say this, um, right, that um, there are practical responsibilities of the closing attorney and in order to ensure that the buyer's experience in the home buying process is positive and successful, the attorney that you choose should be one who communicates often and effectively with the buyers, the sellers, everybody involved in the process and the credit union. One who remains accessible at all times and is responsive to any questions that arise, not only from buyers, but from all parties, is a person who's thorough in reviewing the title, the loan documentation, and all the other informa information, most importantly, the stuff that comes from the seller's side keeps the process moving from the time of the purchase and sale agreement to the closing date, meeting all the deadlines, and someone who enables the, the buyers to offload stress by coordinating and conducting a fluid process to a smooth closing. And I thank everyone for listening and let's have at some questions. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you to all of our presenters. I know that it's a lot of information and I apologize that I had to rush us along, but now I'm going to try to get us through as many questions as possible. So I'm going to try to go rapid fire, quick high points. So the first question that I have, if Mike wouldn't mind answering, uh, Mike, someone asked, with such a large entourage helping one buy a home, about how much money should one be prepared to spend on home inspection, lawyer, et cetera, outside of the cost of down payment? Okay, as far as the home inspection, um, <clears throat> I think Bill would probably be a better judge on that. I'm guessing it's probably going to be somewhere in the range of about, you know, five to 600 in that range. Um, the attorney, um, now it's going to be two separate attorney fees. The lender will have their own attorney, which will normally be around $600. And then if you're going to have a so-called outside attorney review your purchase and sales agreement, you know, depending on how much work you ask them to do, you're probably looking at somewhere between like four and $600, something like that. Um, as far as the closing costs, you know, some of them will depend on the amount of your loan, uh, but you probably want to figure somewhere and again, it's going to be on the dependent on the purchase price and loan, but you may want to figure conservatively somewhere in the range of six to eight thousand dollars. You know, it may be on the high side, but you're always better to, uh, you know, be a little more conservative. Thank you, Mike. And then the next question I have is for Bill. A few of my friends, not mine, the person that's asking, right, had to waive their home inspection to have their offer accepted over another. What are your thoughts on this? It seems really shady. Is it ever worth it to get a dream house? What do you think, Bill? To waive the home inspection? That's right the down. question. To waive the home inspection, uh, I think my um, 
my colleague Paul would admit as well. No, it is not a good idea. It's never a good idea, ever, ever, ever. We are there to educate you on the property, educate you on the property. We're not there just to find things that were wrong with the property. And that process of educating you on how the whole house comes together, how does the system work? How does the electric work, et cetera? Not just flip a switch, turn the faucet on and the water comes out. So it's an educational process of this major purchase that you're buying. Um, and then during that process of education, if we uncover any, what we call hidden defects in the business, that's something the seller didn't know about, then it will benefit you uh, in the long run. Uh, and what has happened is because of limited inventory, supply and demand, that right now in this past year, the business has been, the business has been um, down on home inspections because people are getting multiple offers so people would decide to, th to get the home inspection, let's waive it to get the house. And I don't blame people for doing it, but it's a risk. You have to know that it is a risk to do that. We've had many people call us to do home inspections after they purchase it, which is not the way the process is designed um, and found many problems with the house so that they weren't prepared for. So it's a question of how badly you want the house and how much you want to take the risk. Thank That's you, really Bill. Yep. Yeah, uh, McDonald, can I just add yes. something to that? Yeah. When 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 buyers do uh, get convinced to waive inspections, I still advise them to get an inspection anyway. If you if they're not going to make the uh, you know the purchase contingent on it, because you do want to know what you're getting yourself into. Thank you, Paul. It's it's. Uh, let me add to that too. It's um. We we uh, I just did a seminar last week with a hundred agents and. Uh, it, everybody says the same thing. We don't recommend it to our buyers, but yet, <laughs> but yet everybody's doing it. So, but not everybody, but the, a certain um, percentage of people are doing it. So at the very least you can try to, at the very least is to ask for an inspection for educational purposes only. So if they're not going to pay for the things that are wrong with the house, because they'll take somebody else's offer, but if at least you get an education of the house that what you might be looking at going down the road, then that's a good idea as well. Just like Paul said, everybody, I mean, there isn't an attorney out there or us that would say, I recommend you, you know, skipping over these, you know, cutting corners in this process because eventually it'll cost you. And, uh, but the way the market has been, it's been difficult for people. So we're Thank hoping you, more, Joy comes on, sorry. The next question I have is for Paul, what typical issues might arise from the title review? What kind of issues are common? The most common uh, issues that come up in a title review are um, undischarged mortgages or improperly discharged mortgages from a prior owner. So you, it falls back under the seller to correct all title issues, but they have to get someone who is going to um, correct the chain of, um, of a discharge of a mortgage. So people get a mortgage, that's a lien on your property. And when that gets paid off, then a discharge is supposed to be re also recorded at the registry of deeds. So it cancels out that mortgage lien. When those aren't done properly, then the lien still exists. That's a flaw, in the, in, that's a defect in the title. Thank you, Paul. And we have time for one last question, which I'll have you, Ryan, answer. In the case that family or friends are supplying a gift for down payment, are there any limitations as to when or how much money can be gifted? Yeah, so for the gift, um, I mean, the biggest thing you wanna take a look into tax repercussions, if it's anything over 15,000, there is gonna be some for the, uh, for the grantor. However, you know, we do have what's called a gift letter, which we will need as part of the transaction to qualify that um, as a gift to make sure that it's not gonna be a debt coming up on the loan. We are gonna be going over in depth too in the home buying process tomorrow. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you to everyone for all the great information that you provided. I know that there's a lot more that still these, you know, these presentations could go on for hours. So really appreciate you taking the time. And at this moment, I'm going to just do a quick recap of all the different benefits that folks have available to them. One of them being our financing team. So at any point, 
throughout the process. If you have any questions, know that you have dedicated home financing experts here to help you. You can email them. You can come into a branch, do a phone call, whatever is most convenient for you. In addition, on our website, you can go to home hbcu.org slash home dash loans. And there you'll be able to get more information about our products. And as Ryan mentioned, tomorrow we are doing a home financing presentation. Daisy and Helen will be leading that conversation. Another quick reminder, please take a moment, let us know what could we improve? What other questions do you have for us? Uh, what comments, suggestions? We weren't able to get to all the questions, but I do wanna do a quick plug for our blog. We will utilize those questions to come up with some blog articles. So just if you're not already subscribed to our blog, you can go to blog.hucu.org and subscribe. We have a whole tab dedicated to home buying process where we'll answer many of the questions that we weren't able to answer today. And a very quick disclaimer, you heard from Paul, you heard from Bill, home buying process can be complicated. It can be complex. Make sure that you're getting information and advice from a qualified team. What we provided today, we said it multiple times, it's educational because we don't know your specific situation. So we encourage you to meet with the team and feel comfortable with them. And as a reminder, we're also always here available to you. You can follow us on our social media platforms at MyHUCU. And we hope to see you tomorrow for the closing day of our home buying forum. Tomorrow at 12, we'll have the home buying presentation in English. And then at 1.30, we'll do it in Spanish. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Big virtual round of applause for Paul, Bill, Mike, and Ryan. And we hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.